So we're in the series called Epic, and we've been in it for the last couple of weeks. And really the heart behind the series is to pair up with the devotional, the book called The Awe of God. And I already know just this last week, I've heard several different of, of you guys come to me and just share with me how this book is really challenging you. Um, there's one person who said, I don't want to read it anymore. <laughs> um, and then there's others who said, I've, I've been going to church since I was a kid. And I've never had anyone explain to me what the true fear of God is or to have the awe of God. And maybe you have a very similar experience. That's mine as well. Here's what I would tell you. If you're being challenged and it's maybe challenging some of your spiritual paradigms, ask the Holy Spirit to show you where the meat is and then throw out the bones. But don't shut it out after one week, okay? That's just, you're doing yourself a disservice. And so we would never put something in your hands that would be off-center, outside of the bounds of the Word of God. So I'm telling you, but let yourself be challenged and let the Holy Spirit inform your understanding of what it means to walk in greater awe in the presence of God. Cool? Awesome, awesome. Well, so this series is tied to that. And today what I'm going to be talking about so we're going to be talking about crossroads, because the truth of the matter is, is every Christ follower in this room is constantly being faced with crossroads. And so it's which path to take, which path to take. Each and every one of us, do I move? Do I get this job? Do I do this? Do I go here? Do I marry this person? Do I break up with this person? Do I, all sorts of crossroads. And so Many times for the life of a Christian, we feel like we have to lean on our own understanding or, in this case that I'm about to share with you, you know exactly the path the Lord is leading you and you don't want to take it. Can anybody be honest in that and say there's been times in our lives in the past when we were less mature? Of course. Not today. We always take God's path. Everyone he opens in front of us. But often those paths can look really scary. They could be daunting, they could be overwhelming, and there's another path that seems right to us, and we go, well, that looks like pain and suffering and loss, and I'm going to have to sacrifice. This one looks like I'm winning the lotto and I grow hair. I think I want to take this one. This is the life of a Christian. So how do we know how to choose the right road, and what situations do we put ourselves in that when we choose the wrong one, can lead to trouble. Y'all with me? I'll put it this way, just so we can understand the power of what is actually being presented here, because the road that you choose, the paths that you choose, either lead to life or death and destruction. Did you know that? It's not just about salvation. Truly, the paths that we choose can either lead to life and abundance or death and destruction. And you go, well, that's a little heavy-handed, Dave. You know, I'm visiting here. I just came here for Father's Day because I got drug here. You're over. I can tell you this guy overdoes it. No, um, in Deuteronomy, it actually says this. Now listen, says the Lord. Today I'm giving you a choice between life and what? Death. Between prosperity and what? Yeah. All right. God says today... I've given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. He's saying there is a crossroad in front of every single person listening right now. And one, the one road leads to life and abundance and prosperity, according to the Word of God. Another one leads to life, death, and, dest or de death and destruction and disaster. God says you have the choice to choose which one you want to take. We don't like the fact that God gives us that choice. Because we just want him to keep us on the prosperity path and the life path, and we don't want to have to deal with this. But God says, no, this is your choice between blessings and curses, life and death. And so God says to us, he says, now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Almighty God, now I'm going to... We're just going to witness the choice that you make. But the Lord says this to you. He says, oh, that you would choose life, though, so that you and your descendants may live. The power of your choice not only affects you, but the power of the choices you're making today in every area, big and small, according to the Lord, are and will affect generations that go after you. That's how much power 
your choice has. So it's not a surprise that the enemy wants to show up at every crossroad to get you to take another road, the one that leads to death and destruction. Why? Because all he can do, according to Jesus, is steal, kill, and destroy. And the only way that he could steal from you, kill you, and destroy you is to put you on a path that leads to that outcome. So we have to be wise about our choices, big and small. Y'all with me? I'm going to get right into it. How's that? We're going to look at Jonah and the whale this morning. Jonah and the whale. I know we all know it, but I don't know if we're applying it. I think there may be a bit of a difference here. See, Jonah, gets a, he gets a bad rap, right? Because we understand, spoiler alert, he gets swallowed by a big fish. Okay, y'all, y'all did know that. Are we familiar with Jonah? Okay, all right, good, good, good. Most of us in here. But here's the thing. In this story, Jonah... If you, get, if you look at his life, he's a guy that loves obeying God. He's a man. He's a prophet of God. He's a spokesperson. So he, he follows the Lord. He's got character. He has what it takes, and the Lord has chosen him. But there's this one time where he's presented with a crossroads. Let's get into it. Verse 1, Jonah chapter 1. The Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amittai. God tells Jonah, get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. He says, announce my judgment against it. Why? Because I have seen how wicked these people are. In 2024, God has not changed his opinion about sin and wickedness, guys. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so if the behaviors of the Ninevites appalled him and he calls it wicked... Whatever we're doing here in 2024 as a culture or in our lives personally, and the idols and the sexual perversion and everything else that we accept and celebrate, God calls that wicked and he feels the exact same way about us and our culture and our world as he does with Ninevites. Jonah is at a crossroads. Everyone say crossroads. And this is the one that God is saying, this is the path that leads to life. But the problem is, is he wants to take the other one. He doesn't want to go on to that path to to Nineveh. So he's kind of conflicted. He's like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go to Nineveh. I don't want to talk to those losers over there. You're going to find out a little bit more about that here in a second. I would just rather go this path because it seems nicer to me. It seems better. So which one does he choose? Verse 3, Jonah got up and he went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. There are runners in this room this morning. You know the Lord. You've walked with the Lord. You have tasted and seen that he is good, but you're running. And let me tell you what running can look like. Running could look like coming in this room every Sunday, sitting in the chairs, singing the songs, listening to me, but not applying the word of God in your life. Just because you agree with what, we, what, what you've experienced today, what, just because you agree with the preaching and go, that's good, that's true, if we don't apply it, we are not following the direction of God. This is for application. We, want, we don't want to be hearers of the word. We want to be doers of the word, Right? So for those listening, the Lord just sometimes gives me insight to who I'm talking to on a particular Sunday. So I'm going to read it exactly the way he gave it to me yesterday. There's those listening right now, and you're like Jonah in the sense that you have known and followed God like I had already mentioned, but you're facing a crossroads moment in your life. For some, God has been saying, cut off that relationship with that person because they're leading you to compromise. They may be sweethearts, but they're leading you to compromise. For others, he's been saying, you really do need to find a new job because you are not spending enough enough time with your family. These are really specific. I understand that. But this is what the Lord put on my heart. For others, the Lord has said and has been telling you, and this is not a, I'm not trying to persuade you. I'm just telling you this is the other thing the Lord put on my heart. The Lord has been really stirring some of your hearts to use your time and your talent to serve in this ministry. This is your house. Or to tithe. But the path over here looks better. It's nicer to sleep in on a Sunday morning and watch me online. Welcome, everybody. Right? Not not that everybody's slacking. I'm just simply saying. Just trying to make a point. 
But we're all, including me, guys, just this past week, there's things that I want to do the opposite. Because I don't want to, I don't want to do this part. I don't want to go up and have a quiet time. There are days I don't want to do that. And don't look at me that way, because you do too. <laughs> Otherwise, you, you haven't been saved long enough. Because the truth of the matter is, is that there will be times when God says, do this, and you aren't going to want to do it. So Jonah isn't bad, but he's presented with this, and he goes, nah, not today, Lord. I don't have it in me. I need some me time. So he gets on a boat, and he goes the opposite direction of, the, of where God is telling him to go. But why? Why? Well, I mean, what's his issue with the Ninevites? The reason why he doesn't want to go to the Ninevites is he, bottom line, he doesn't feel like they deserve God's grace. He can't stand the Ninevites. They're horrible, horrible people, and they've been horrible to people Jonah knows. And so God is saying, go and tell them how wicked they are so that they can repent of their sin and be made right with me so I can walk in right relationship with him. And Jonah, being a man of God, goes, nah, that's where I draw the line. Those folks are losers, man. I don't want anything to do with them. He saw their lifestyles. He saw the bumper stickers on their cars. He saw how wicked their culture was. He saw the way that they dressed. He saw the types of people they sleep with. He looked at their sin and just wanted God to destroy them. There are those listening this morning who are like Jonah in the sense where you see certain groups of people and you see their worldviews and their lifestyles, and their wickedness, yes, and their sin, but you cannot bring yourself to love them. You deep down just want to see God judge them. That is a bloodthirst that is not of the Lord. You deep down want them to be judged and condemned, but that is not the Lord's heart. Jesus came to save and seek those who are lost. Show how this idea and this view of they deserve judgment and match it with the life of Jesus and his ministry. You won't see that. Jesus said, I did not come into the world to condemn the world, but I came that it may be saved. He took the judgment of God. So the judgment you're wanting to see thrown on people, Jesus, if you're a Christian, should probably know this little fact. Jesus took judgment upon himself. So judgment has already been exacted against wicked people in our culture. They just don't know that God wants to lead them to love and life. That's where our job comes in as sons and daughters. We have been called to the what? The Great Commission. The Great Commission is to do what? Go into all edges of the earth and declare the good news about Jesus. So yelling at your television and praying that people, that God just smacks down this group and sets this one on fire and gives this one some sort of terrible disease. They deserve it. They're tearing our country apart. No, what's tearing our country apart is disobedience from Christians. We're not sharing the gospel. That's what's screwing up this country. You're like, David, just go back to reading your notes, bro. It's just so true. All right. This is where Jonah's at. So if you feel that way, and you want to see dirty, rotten sinners smited, you're not alone, because Jonah, Jonah's right there. He's like, they don't know. I don't want to go tell them God loves them. They, they're horrible people. So now he's on a boat, and he's cruising along, going the opposite direction of God, whatever that means. I hate to break it to him, but it, the earth is round. Okay, so, oh, there's Jonah again. Oh, there's Jonah again. Oh, there's Jonah again. Oh, he's running for me. No, there's Jonah. For the flat earthers, he, he would just go and maybe f fall off the edge. I mean, it's, either way, it's not good. Verse 4. <laughs> Let's get back into the Word of God. So Jonah's on this boat, going the opposite direction, took the wrong road at the crossroads, and look what happens. The Lord hurled a powerful wind over the sea. And he caused a violent storm to threaten to break that ship apart. So imagine you're Jonah, and out of nowhere, this mighty storm rises up. And now everyone's threatened. If we're walking in a disobedience, the Lord will be gracious with you. He's gracious with me. 
He will lovingly nudge you, nudge you, nudge you, call you back, forgive, restore, put you on the right path. But when we continually go, ah, no, I really do think I want to take this one after all. And we do that enough times. Oh, that you would choose life is what he says. But you got the choice between life and death. And so what I'm telling you is we open ourselves up to the storms of our own choices when we choose the path to destruction. It seems to match. What we have already learned with Jonah is, yes, God gives us the power to choose our actions, but we don't have the power to choose our consequences. We can't get mad at God when we make dumb choices and experience the consequences of stupidity or rebellion. The storm would have never hit Jonah. It wouldn't have touched him if he hadn't run from God's call and direction in his life. So the storm is threatening to destroy the ship, and so Jonah comes clean to the sailors, these pagan sailors, and he goes, guys, look, I'm the one who brought this storm on. It is completely my fault. And in verse 10, the sailors were terrified when they heard this, for they had, he had already told them he was the one running away from the Lord. These sailors are pagans. They're wicked. They don't worship God. And yet they have enough fear of God to go, why did you do this, Jonah? Why would you run from God? What idiot does that? I just think that's interesting. And so since the storm was getting worse all the time, they asked him, well, what are we supposed to do now to stop this storm, Jonah, since you're the one who brought it in through your disobedience to the Lord Almighty? He goes, the only answer I've got to tell you is just throw me into the sea and let me die, and the sea will come, become calm again. I know that this terrible storm is all my fault. You hear the pain in that, in that statement? Do you feel that? You ever been in a situation where you've created a big mess in your family or at your job or in your life or in your finances or fill in your own blanks and you realize this was all my fault. I broke the thing. This is, I did this. When we choose our own way instead of God's way, what it requires of us, if we want to get made right with God, true repentance requires us to take responsibility for our disobedience. I'll say that one more time. True repentance requires you and I to take responsibility for our own disobedience. Okay? Listen, as I'm reading this story for the 4,000th time as a pastor... One thing that sticks out to me every time is you can fault Jonah all that you want, but he doesn't blame his parents for his poor upbringing. He doesn't blame his spouse for not meeting his needs. He doesn't blame his pastor. He doesn't blame the boss. Jonah blames the storm on one thing, Jonah's disobedience to God to take the wrong path. Well, the sailors took him at his word and said, okay, well, that's the way we're going to be able to live it's been nice knowing you. The sailors picked Jonah up. They threw him into the raging sea, and the storm, boop, stopped at once. Now the Lord had arranged. How does that get you? The Lord had arranged. When I make arrangements, that means I'm in advance calling a place and setting a reservation, making sure that... We he arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. I've stayed in some pretty nasty hotels in my life. But nothing matches the GI tract of a big fish. But if you don't know how the digestive system works, if you're now in the stomach of a big fish, you probably won't stay in your current state and form for very long. Because the acids in this animal's stomach are designed to dissolve whatever living thing they've just eaten, and then it goes out the other end. Jonah is stuck in this dark beast under the sea. If I'm Jonah, if you're Jonah, how many of us would go, it's over? It's over. The storm didn't get me, but the fish is. It's over. God has abandoned me in this fish to die. And I share this because some of you folks, some of y'all here today, I love you. You feel this way. 
you feel like you've crossed too many lines, you've chosen too many paths that were not of the Lord, you feel that God has put you on hold. He set you off to the side, and he's done with you. And he'd rather just work with some people who would cooperate with him than spend any more time chasing you. We think that that's how he works. This may be how you feel this morning. But to those stuck and isolated in the pit of whatever stomach you have allowed yourself to wind up in, to those who feel abandoned by God this morning because of your choices, I want to explain to you what Psalm 139 has to say. Psalm 139 says, to those who feel abandoned by God this morning, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you're there. But if I go down to the grave, you're also there too. Jonah is stuck in the belly of the fish. And in this place of isolation, brokenness, and pain, what he does is he humbles himself and he chooses to confess his sin to God. Now he's just as wicked as the people he was supposed to be going to to tell, stop being wicked. He's disobeyed God. The truth of the matter is you could be the best Christian on planet Earth. But that's the why we extend grace to people who are still in bondage and isolation or to Christians who blow it. We have to because it's only one decision away from all of us that we find ourselves in the same spot. It's only self-righteous people who are blind to how sinful they are that act like they don't sin anymore and this is not an issue in their lives. But for those of us who are still rooted in the reality of our spiritual walk and being transformed by the, into the image of God, slowly but surely, we're gonna fall. We're gonna mess up. We're gonna take the wrong path. And so what the enemy will say is, well, you made your bed, sleep in it, it's over for you. Well, that's a lie from hell. But then there's the self-righteous folks who go, I never do that. I would never choose the wrong path. I always choose the right path. And you know what, David? I wonder if you actually choose the right path. I mean, right? We got that. I'd rather just be in the middle and go, Lord, help me to hang on tight and choose the right path. But I can't choose it unless you show me which one to take. And then give me the guts and the will to do it. That's the next step. It's one thing to know the right path and go, well, you check, I know the right path. It's another thing to step onto it and walk on it. All right. So he humbles himself. He confesses his sin before the Lord. He cries out from this fish. Get this picture in your mind. This is a man of God anointed by him to be his spokesperson and his herald. And he cries out and he remembers God. It said, then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God from inside the fish, inside his hopeless, stuck, isolated situation. Son and daughter of God, if you feel abandoned by God because of your choices and your proclivities towards whatever, you can call on God in the pit that you're in. He cried out, my, the Lord, in, he said, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble, and he answered me. He said, I call to you from the land of the dead, O Lord, and you heard me. Jonah remembers the Lord, and look at what he says. As my life was slipping away, so he's dying in the fish. He's dying. I remembered the Lord. So to those of you who feel stuck and you've put yourself in this spot because of your rebellion against the Lord and your sin and all the rest of this stuff, right here, remember the Lord. Don't forget the Lord. He said, in my earnest prayer, it went out to you into your holy temple. And so I will offer sacrifices to you with songs of praise, and I will fulfill my vows, for my salvation comes from who? Okay, so his salvation is not going to come from his own strength and his own wisdom to find out a way to find the blowhole so he could squeeze through it and get out. His salvation, he understands, starts with God, is sustained by God, and kept by God. He can't save himself. And maybe that's where the Lord is needed to get some of you, where you are in a place where you literally realize, I cannot save myself. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up in honor, is what he says. So why did Jonah pray that, though? Because he still knew that while disobedience leads to isolation and dead ends, God is willing to meet us wherever we go. I want to put that point up. I want these folks to see it. While disobedience leads to isolation and dead ends, God is willing to meet us wherever we find ourselves. 
And I believe the Lord is beginning to work in this room. I really do. It's going to turn hopeful. And it, we just took our first turn towards hopeful and hope. But be, be aware of distractions in the room right now. Okay? Just be aware of it. And understand that the enemy is trying to get you distracted, some of you, so that you stay stuck in your situation. Or so that you would continue to stay on the wrong path to death and destruction. Steward your own moment here with the Lord. Jonah does what the psalmist does in Psalm 120 where he says, I took my troubles to the Lord. I cried out to him and he what? So if you're troubled this morning, if you're stuck, you don't know what to do next now that you're in the position that you're in, take your troubles to the Lord. Take the, your troubles to the Lord. You can cry out to him and he will answer your prayer. So to those who've taken the wrong path this morning, I have good news for you, man. Today, you can repent, which is literally, I say this every time because I understand how the word has this connotation of super churchy, judgy kind of stuff. No, literally, it just says, change your direction. Noah, or Jonah, literally needed to repent because he, what did it say at the beginning of the story? He was going the opposite direction of the Lord. So in order to go the right direction of the Lord, what do you have to do? You've got to turn around. That's what repent means, turn around. If you're taking that direction, but you want the Lord is leading you with an opportunity in his grace to take the right direction, you're repenting. Repentance, you can tell God, look, I'm in trouble. I've put myself in this situation. Would you please save me from the mess that I've allowed myself to get into? But Pastor David, I don't know why everybody talks like that who's, who's on the outside of the will of God, but Pastor David, I've gone too far. I've done too much. You don't know what I've been involved in. You don't know what I've done. No, I don't, and I probably don't want to know. <laughs> but the Lord wants to remind you of his nature, and so would you hear this word of the Lord right now? Psalm says the Lord is compassionate and he's merciful and he's slow to get angry. The Lord is slow to get angry. He's filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us. Look at the scripture. Nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all of our sins. That's what the Bible says. Read it in black and white. I know the rule keepers in here, we, we get bothered by this because we're like, darn it, we're gonna give them license to keep sinning. Don't worry about them. Pray for them. Let them understand the grace and the, the awe of God. Amen. And then they'll learn how to obey this, this God because they have the right image of him. But this is, this is his nature too. He will not constantly accuse you nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all of our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we, in fact, deserve, though. Let's keep on trucking. For his unfailing love towards those who fear him, everybody say fear him, okay? Not be scared of him, which is why you need to read this book that I'm telling you about. For those who fear him is as great as as the height of the heavens above the earth. What is his love? That's what the Bible is saying. And he has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children. Well, what constitutes a good father? Right here. He's tender. Look at what it says. He's tender. He is compassionate to those who fear him. He forgives all my sins and he heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me instead with love and tender mercies. And he fills my life with good things. My youth whew, is renewed like the eagles. This is what saying, I'm sorry, I repent, produces in your life. Why wouldn't we repent? Because we really like choosing our own paths. We understand that they're destructive. 
but we have some friends on that path and we don't want to abandon them. We have some habits on that path that feed us and give us these temporary highs. There are things on that path financially that says, please don't leave us. We can't quit you. All your addictions and the greed and the lust for money and power and sex and prestige and likes and follows and all those things are like, please, no, what are you doing? Your identity is over here. But you know it leads to destruction, but they're like, come on, it won't be for a while anyway. Hang on. Repent in the fall. How's that? Let's have one last big summer. Let's do it outright. And then in the fall, you can get your stuff straight. That path is glittery and it looks amazing. And this path over here looks narrow and kind of boring and really non inspiring often. Read the Bible. Stop having sex. Can't look at porn anymore. Can't get drunk. Can't get buck wild. Can't get barefoot in the club. Whatever it is. <laughs> to reference like a 35-year-old reference. But you know what I'm trying to say? God, now I got to show up to church and I got to change diapers for the Lord now and get tithe. Oh my gosh. God says there are two paths. <laughs> one leads to death. The other one leads to him. This sounds like a God that's ready for you to repent this morning. This passage in Psalms that I just shared with you, it sounds like God really wants to say, we're cool. Welcome back to the right path. I have your purpose. I have promise. I have protection for you. You have me on this path, the path that leads to life. As soon as Jonah repents and comes before the Lord and takes ownership of his stuff, look what the Lord ordered the fish to do. The Lord then ordered the fish to spit Jonah out onto the beach. Here's what happens in chapter 3. Now that he's been spit out onto a beach by a fish. Read this first sentence really slowly. Then the Lord spoke to Jonah Say it with me. A second time. A second time. I want to tell you this morning that the Lord is the God of second chances. And could this be your day where you can call out to the Lord, own your stuff, Repent of your sins, be made right with him, be willing to take the path that he has chosen for you. Whether you understand where it's going or not, but you know if he's on it, that's where you want to be. Could it be today the Lord has afforded you a grace that is finite, and he's afforded you a window of time for a second chance? What if the Lord wants to give you a second chance today? Or do you want to harden your heart against the Lord? and keep on trucking. You could do that too. He spoke to Jonah a second time. He said, get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message that I have given you, Jonah. He's not being ugly. He's not being funny. He's just saying, this is where your path leads, son. So what happens is, is this time, Jonah obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh. But the thing that stands out to me right now is remember, Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh because they're wicked people and they deserve to be judged, right? But isn't it something how you can have grace for someone else that has struggled with the thing that you've struggled with? When I talk to somebody who has struggled with addiction or struggles with depression, I don't, I don't judge them. I don't, because I've walked those paths. And there's a there's a grace that I feel and a sensitivity because I can relate. I can empathize with the struggle. I can empathize with the fact that, oh, I know where you're at. I get it. Let me tell you what the Lord has done for me. Maybe God truly does work all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose because what the Lord has done in this process is the Lord has taken what was meant for evil and destruction for Jonah to silence his prophetic voice, 
What the Lord has now done is he's even redeemed his disobedience to the point where now he sees the Ninevites in a different light because all they're doing is choosing the wrong path like he has. All they're doing is just going the opposite direction of God like he did. The flavor may be different, but the outcome's the same. I think now the Lord has prepared him even further. He's given him a shepherd's heart to a degree. Let me, I don't want to sell Jonah too hard because he's still kind of upset about the idea that the Lord wants to do this. But this time Jonah obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh and the city was so large and full of wicked people that it took three days to see it all. What this should tell us and what do we need to get from this sermon? Repentance course corrects our paths and it has the power to restore that which has been lost in our lives. So that means today, if you're willing to repent, if you're willing to turn your direction and begin to take the path of Jesus and receive forgiveness of your sins and stop walking in wickedness and destruction is in your future and separation from God and hell, it's just true. It's what the Bible says. Then wouldn't it be crazy to imagine that the Lord loves you so much that he would put my big mouth in front of you on this Father's Day to say, there's another way. There's another way. So regardless of where you are in your life, the truth is, is you may be right on the right path, but you're going to be faced with a crossroads at some point soon. So before we get out of here, I want to share with you three things so we can begin to learn how to choose better paths in our lives because we're all facing crossroads right now. So the first thing that I would sell, tell you is this. What seems like the right path to you may actually be the worst one you can take. Do y'all follow that? What seems like the right path may be the worst one you could possibly take. And I've shared this before, but I was in Dallas overnight. This was like gee whiz, 30 years ago, I was in, I literally, I was in Dallas, I was moving to Nashville, I get on the highway the next morning, and I'm making my way to Nashville, and I'm supposed to go through Arkansas to get up to Tennessee, right? And I'm driving, and I was on a path that seemed truly right to me. I'm looking at the map, I'm like, this is right. Everybody passing by, if they looked over at me, they're like, that guy knows exactly where he's going, and I did too. I really believed where I was headed was the right direction until about two hours in, I saw Welcome to Louisiana, not kidding. How do you miss an entire state? Someone who sees a path and it seems right to them, but in the end it leads to destruction. That's exactly what Proverbs 14 says. There is a path before each person. That means you and it means me. That seems right, but in the end leads to what? That's scary, guys. This isn't like poetic, artsy death. This is death destruction but the path seems right to us so just because it seems right for you to leave your spouse because you're tired of them and you've had enough doesn't mean it's the right path but it seems right but it may not be just because it seems right to sleep with your boyfriend or your girlfriend or have online interactions with people sexually, I'm just saying, I say it in love. It may seem right to you because you care for this person or you have people in your life applauding it saying it's totally fine. It may seem right to you but if the Bible says that actually that's the path that leads to separation from God and death, then it's a destructive path. Just because it seems right to support behaviors in our culture that the Bible, though, calls sin and leads to death. You see, regardless of how good we think our intentions are, because we evaluate ourselves based upon our motives, but we judge everyone else based on their actions. Have you noticed that? Just because we look in our own heart and we go, well, my intentions mean well. I want to be a loving, accepting person. That's fine. That's your intention. Regardless of how right certain things seem. Everyone say seem. But we're evaluating our culture and our lives and what's in front of us based upon what limited context we've got. But God sees everything. He sees the beginning from the end. And if he goes, no, that's what I'm talking about. 
that, those are paths that lead to death. There's a path that seems right to a man, the Bible says, but leads to death. So regardless of how right certain things may seem to you, without the Bible and the Holy Spirit in our lives showing us the path to life, we will inevitably take the wrong path every time. I'm just telling you right now, it is just true. So how do we learn to take the right path? So what do we do? Allow the Word of God to illuminate your steps. If you're not in the Word of God, if you're not reading the Word of God, if you're not allowing the Holy Spirit to show you what the Word of God is actually saying, then you now have to guess as a Christian what is right. Well, we're just now back into the same situation where it seems right, but we're not walking the right path. And so the Bible is God's gift to us to show us. And so this is why Psalm 119 explains your word, the word of God, is a what? It's a lamp to my feet and a light for my what? The path that leads to life. So the Bible is critical in our lives to be able to show us the way that we should go so that we can walk in prosperity, life, and abundance as declared in Deuteronomy. So when we allow the Bible to illuminate our steps and God promises that he'll show us which path to take, listen to this. Isaiah says, when we begin to walk in step with the Holy Spirit on the right path, you will get to a point as a Christian where it says your own ears will hear him. Right behind you, you will hear a voice by the Holy Spirit saying, this is the way that you should go, whether to the right or to the left. So God doesn't want to play hide-and-go-seek with you, and he doesn't want to play games and, you know, find the path. He doesn't want to do that. He's saying if you pray, you walk in repentance, you allow my word to inform my character and yours, and then you allow the Holy Spirit to illuminate your steps through the word, I will tell you where to go. I will tell you who to marry. I will tell you which job you need to take. I will tell you what church to serve and love and be a part of. I will tell you how to handle that marriage that is breaking apart. I will illuminate your paths. And his paths lead to life. The last thing I would tell you is ask God to show you which path to take in every area of your life. So if we're not praying, if we're not coming before the Lord, saying, God, show me which path to take, then we have the Word of God, we've got the Holy Spirit, but now we need to say, where do you want me to go? And if he says, hang tight, then hang tight. If he says, go backwards, go backwards. If he says, move forward, or go left, or go right, he will do that because he loves you. The path matters to him because it leads to his heart. There isn't one decision, big or small, in this room that doesn't have God's plan and design on your life. Did you know that? Big or small? So as each of us stare at the crossroads this morning, this is a prayer that I pray every single morning before I get out of bed. I pray, and I want you to look at this. This is, I want you to pray it out loud with me. So Father, we're going to come before you right now in Jesus' name, Father. And as a church, as your body, this is our prayer to you this morning. Now pray it out loud with me. No, there we go. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> there we go. Oh Lord, I give my life to you. Show me the right path. Oh Lord, point out the road for me to follow. Lead me by your truth and teach me. For you are the God who saves me. And all day long, I put my hope in you. So before we leave, there are those listening and those in this room. And maybe you have never followed the path of God, meaning you've never repented of your sin before. And you may be a good person, and so you, it may seem that you're on the right path because you're a good person, and maybe by our own standards you are. You're probably better than me, I'll tell you that. Certainly in traffic, I guarantee you're a nicer person. But that seems right to you, and so if, we, if it seems right that we're on the right path because we're good people, that's actually a path that leads to destruction because we are saved by Christ through his sacrifice and his resurrection from the dead. And anybody who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Your path 
is really critically important because your path that you're on either leads one of two directions according to the Bible. Either you're headed to separation from God in hell when you die, or you're headed to salvation and eternal life through Christ. Jesus put it this way. He said, when it comes to the path, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and the gate is wide for many that choose that way. Jesus said, but the gateway to what? Life is very narrow and the road is difficult and only a few will ever find it. I really appreciate that Jesus is a straight shooter. And so if I know that that's true and I see that and I, I, I wanna, I understand, I don't want my path to lead to the broad path that the world is on. But if there's a narrow path that leads to a gate that allows me to enter in and only few find it, then what do I need to do to get on that path? Because at some point, all of us will take our last breath. And then whatever path we have chosen, that's the path that you have chosen. But could it be in this very moment, the Lord has brought you in here because he loves you and he's wanting to forgive you and he wants to put you on the pathway to life. If you wanna be put on the pathway to life to where you follow Jesus, call upon him right now and repent of your sins and you will be saved. If you don't know what to say, just bow your head right now and just tell him in faith. Just tell him right now, this is your moment. This is an exchanging of your path. Just tell him right now in faith, dear Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner, but right now, with the faith that you've given me, I put it in you. Tell them in faith right now, God, I wanna switch paths. Put me on your path, Lord. I believe you died on the cross for my sins, thank you. I believe you rose from the dead on the third day, thank you. I'm asking you to save me. I repent of my sins and I make you the Lord of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. And if you just prayed that prayer and you meant it from the bottom of your heart, from the sincerity of your heart, the Bible says you just got saved. And the Lord, by his power, puts you on the right path. So if you just prayed that, at the count of three, put your hand up super high so we can celebrate our brothers and sisters who just made this decision in Christ. One, two, three. Put your hand up super high. If anyone in this room this morning has prayed that prayer, if you've prayed online, then please let us know in the comments below. Would you stand to your feet? What a full service. <laughs> um, we covered a lot of ground and the worship and just the spirit of God is here. And so if you are new here, we are thankful that you're here. Our big red doors are open to anybody in the world to come in here. And so we welcome you in the name of Jesus. And my prayer is that we wouldn't be the fanciest church, but I pray that we really are the nicest. And so Great Oaks Fellowship, can I tell you one thing before we get out of here really quickly? I had a secret shopper come two weeks ago. And this is a buddy of mine from Colorado. He's six foot eight, tall, bald, white guy. Like he stands out like, like a giant's thumb, okay? And I love him. And his name's Aaron, and he's a dear friend of mine. And so he came and visited at the 11 o'clock. Can I tell you something? He got out of his car from the first time guest parking. He walked through the tent. He walked through our big red doors, walked through our lobby, sat down right over there. Not one person said hello to him. F. Then it was the meet and greet time. He's standing over there. He looks like John, the Goliath over there. He's standing over there during the, hey, welcome your neighbor time. Not one person went over and said hi to him. Our church is gonna be what we make it. So can we be the friendliest church on 1604 or at least fight to get to the number one spot? That means you're gonna have to be friendly, okay? And so this is our church. And so I encourage you today, if you see someone you don't know, and I promise you, you do, go say hi to them. Wish, wish them a great day. Pray a blessing over them. Give them a high five. Just acknowledge them. We all want to be seen. We all need to be seen. 
We need to be accepted. We need a fun environment, and we need a place to, to where we can be encouraged. This is Great Oaks Fellowship. All right, so Father, would you now seal this word in the name of Jesus? Lord, thank you for our fathers, albeit them may, may be flawed or jacked up, but Lord, at least you use them to do their part to get us here. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. So I pray blessings over the men of God in here that are trying to lead their families. Lord, would you help me lead my family? Would you help me be a good daddy? And I pray, Lord, and ask these things in the name of Jesus. We all said together, amen. All right, love you guys. See you next week.